Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I'm here this morning to introduce one who is well known to most of us who have been coming to the conference in the past few years. His name is John Hesketh. In Liverpool, we call him my brother. John is my brother from another mother. <laughs> we all know John and those who do not know him. He grew up not with the Christian formation, although his parents were Christians, but they were not practicing until he was 21. Then he got baptized in the Church of England. And then afterwards, he went on a journey of searching, wanting to find out more about the Lord. He went to different churches and kept on asking and finding out about the Lord. And finally, while in West Sussex, he met a priest, a Catholic priest, who introduced him to the Catholic faith. And since then, he continued to be go, go, going to the Church of England while at the same time going to different churches. Then finally, he came back to Liverpool. And while in Liverpool, he decided to convert to become a Catholic. He did theology at the Liverpool Hope University. He did a degree in theology and psychology. And later on, he went on to the United States of America and did a master's degree in theology at the Steubenville University. When he came back, after doing ministry in California and a few places in the USA, he continued to do ministry in Liverpool and became a speaker. As a speaker, John has spoken here and at different places in England, as well as abroad. But one thing I know about John as I call him my brother from another mother, is that he is a very passionate man. A few of you probably will remember that last year I spent some time with Miles Dempsey before he passed on ministering to him. One day Miles Dempsey asked that he wanted to see John and Gary. And as I was talking to him, I said, but why do you want to see John? He said, John gives me something that is very different enthusiasm, a true joy, childlike joy that I rejoice when I see him and I talk to him. And indeed, this is very true. When John came up to the hospital and was with Miles Dempsey, Miles lighted up and he was so happy because John could touch him in a very particular way. And John indeed has touched so many of us in a particular way. Let us this morning open our hearts. Let us this morning open our lives and allow John to touch us in that particular and special way. John. And so I invite you to join me in praying for my brother from another mother. So Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for John. We thank you for his faith. We thank you for his ministry. Fill him now, Lord, with your power. Fill him with your strength. That whatever word he says and speaks to us will come directly from you to our hearts. Use him, Lord, as the vessel of your glory through Christ our Lord, Amen. John Hesker. Thank you very much, Father Cliff. What an introduction. I did not know that I filled Miles with so much joy and enthusiasm when I seen him until he just said that. So my heart's beating a little bit faster. That was a great surprise. Um, but I'd like to open up in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, I ask you now to anoint me in the way that you want to be anointed. Help me to speak your words. Let your words come through my mouth and let them be truth and truth alone. 
open every heart. Lord, I ask you to break down every wall, remove every obstacle. And I ask you, Mary, for your intercession, for your continued prayers, that you increase the graces that you give to each one of us here, especially this week. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What an honor it is to talk about this sacrament, the sacrament of reconciliation, because what better way, really, to start this week than to have the opportunity to go and experience this sacrament, because many of us have blocks within our lives. We have obstacles to God's grace. And this week, God wants to fill us with as much grace as we can possibly handle. And then he will stretch us even more so that we can be filled with even more grace. And all this grace, as we know, comes to us through our blessed mother, who is the mediatrix of all graces. But if we have unconfessed sin, those graces cannot penetrate. We cannot receive the graces that God wants to give us if we have blocks, obstacles, sins in the way. So we have to get serious about our sins. We have to get serious about the sacrament of reconciliation. And when we go, we have to learn how to remove our masks. And this is the perfect week to do it. This is where we can leave so much of our fakeness at home and we can come here with each other and be as real as we possibly can be. And that's hard. It's very hard. I know how hard that is because for a long time I wore a mask. I wanted people to believe that I was better than I really am, that I was more loving than I really am, that I'm more Catholic than I really am. And yet confession taught me that I'm just as human as everybody else and nobody is different. We are all the same, every single one of us. We need this sacrament. We need it more than we realize, otherwise God would never have given it to us. And so we pray that God will help us to empty ourselves. That's what this sacrament is. It's where we begin to empty ourselves of self so that we can allow more room for God to come in and take complete control, possess us 100%. How much of God do you want in your life? How much of him do you want to possess in you? The only time we usually hear about possessions is to do with the demonic, isn't it? And exorcisms. The, de the devil absolutely wants to possess you, but so does God. And so we have to be, how much? 90% possessed by God? It's entirely up to you, it's your decision. I can't tell you this is what you need to do. You know what you need, but it's up to you how much of God you want in your life. Your choice, no one can force you. And if you want 100%, you've got to give 100%. You've got to give 100%. Before you even go to confession, and that's where you become face to face with God, real about who you are, and you share with him your sins, because he has all these gifts that he wants to give us. Now, if I was to ask you a question, what do you think is the most powerful gift that God could give to a human being besides himself? Obviously, that's the most powerful. But besides that, what is the most powerful gift that you would like God to give to you if he could? Can you imagine what kind of a gift would you ask for? Maybe you think the power, most powerful gift is to raise the dead, stop somebody from dying. Well, the problem is they're gonna die again. Okay, maybe I'll have the gift of not allowing anybody to die. Well, then you don't get to heaven. Okay, maybe I'll have the gift of curing all these sicknesses and diseases. Well, what good is that again if you're gonna die? And what good is that if when you die, you don't go to heaven, you go somewhere else? Not much good. See, I believe this, the most powerful gift that God has given to us through our priests 
is the gift to absolve us from our sins. Because when we have that, we have eternal life in that moment and we know it. Our sins get in our heads and they mess with us and they bring us all kinds of doubts and confusions and they attack our worthiness so that we don't think, I'm not worthy, I'm not going to be with God. Am I going to be with God? I don't know. But when you walk out of confession, you know it. There is a grace that comes with it. There is a peace that comes with it. There is a conviction that comes with it. And so I think the gift to be able to absolve us from our sins is one of the most powerful gifts that the church has given us. And boy, do we take it for granted. If the Virgin Mary herself was sitting in church, everybody would form a line miles long to go and see her. And yet she cannot forgive you of your sins. But the priest can. And you go to confessionals, and usually today, they're quite empty, aren't they? And a confession is life changing. So what I want to talk about is the prayer of absolution. I absolutely love this prayer. As Father Cliff said, I wasn't brought up knowing anything about my faith. I was baptized when I was a baby, Church of England. And then I started to get to know my faith later on as a Church of England. And then as I came into the church as a Catholic, I started to know about this sacrament for the very first time. And it, it was very mysterious because why do you need to go through a priest to get to God? Why does God need to forgive you through another human being? Why do I as a sinner need to go to another sinner? And yet, there, I can tell you now the difference between confessing to God through a priest and then confessing one-on-one. -on -one. It's completely different. And the difference, I would say, is peace of mind. Because when I confessed to God, I wasn't really sure if I truly meant it. I wasn't really sure if he actually did forgive me. And there was absolutely nothing stopping me from repeating those sins again. But after confession, the last thing I want to do is go through all that again. You know, I don't want to go through the shame. It's, there's a lot of shame. Especially when you're standing there in line and everybody can see you. It's like an ID parade. And so I don't want to go through that again. So I'm, I get, have to be a little bit more serious about my sins. And not only that, you get advice as well. You get feedback. The priest is allowed to go a little bit deeper and help you. So I want to go through this prayer of absolution because I think it is the most beautiful prayer. And I'll say it slowly and then I'll go through it a little bit at a time. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his son has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. And this part melts me. Through the ministry of the church, May God give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How powerful. Now, I'm not a priest, so you still got to go. But given this talk, and given many other talks, I have to ask myself, do I believe what I'm saying? What I'm telling people, do I believe every single word of it? And if I don't, I don't include it. At the beginning, when giving talks, I simply gave it because this is what the church taught. And it, also, it kind of became automatic. But now I stop and I think, do I actually believe this and why? And so going through this prayer, line by line, I ask myself, do I truly believe what it is that I'm saying, that I'm hearing, that the priest is saying, that the priest is telling me, do I actually believe it? Do you believe it? You've probably, like me, never thought about it before. You go in, you tell the priest your sins, he gives you this absolution, and you think, phew, I made it. God didn't take me before I came here. And yet we take that for granted. We might not even hear most of the words. We certainly hear, I absolve you, don't we? We hear that bit. We want to hear that bit. But those words are powerful. And I believe every single word of this, 
God, the Father of mercies. I absolutely believe it. The Father of Jesus Christ. Jesus gave us his divine mercy, showed us his mercy. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him will not die, but will have everlasting life. That's God, the Father of mercies. God is love. And anyone who lives in him lives in love, and God lives in him. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. How has the Father loved Jesus? Infinitely, completely, 100%. How does Jesus love us? Exactly the same. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself. If I could sum up this prayer, this sacrament, in one word, I would call it unity. I really would. Unity. In fact, this sacrament is all about triunity, the Trinity. Because the very first thing we hear is God the Father of mercies. And some of us, when we enter confession, we say, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned, or forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And note, we note that the priest is also in there, in the person of Christ, in persona Christi. And yet we also read that God has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit. So right here we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We have the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have everything. We have unity. Now all of us here, we have unity, but there is also disunity. There's unity, but there's also division. We are united spiritually because of our baptism. As St. Paul likes to remind us, there is one faith, so we are united by our faith. There is one baptism. We are united by our baptism. There is one Lord. We are united by Jesus Christ because he is the head and we are the body. And there is one body. So there is unity in our faith. There is unity in our spirituality. We are one. We are unity because we are all human. We are united because we are all sinners. Nobody is better than anybody else. Just because I'm up here telling you this stuff doesn't make me any different than any one of you. I still got to go to confession. The Pope still has to go to confession. Everybody still has to confess their sins. And we all, as St. Paul says, and if he said it, and he's one of the greatest saints, he said, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All, without exception. Every single one of us. And so, there is unity in our sins. There is unity in the sense that we are sinners. But there is un disunity because of our sins. Disunity because sin divides. Sin separates. And you know this in your own families. When there is sin, there is division between husband and wife. Who love each other? Sin gets in the way of love. It divides. It gets in the way of you and your children. Your children and you. It gets in the way of families. It destroys families, divides families, destroys friendships, divides friendships. And so now many of you are here. We're all united, but we're all divided as well because of our sins. What happens after confession? Complete unity. We're all united. Now it's difficult if you in your family go to confession and the other family members don't. It's difficult, but it only takes one person to transform a family. And you might be the sacrificial lamb of that family in order to, to save that family. So you definitely need to go to confession because you need more grace. You need all the grace you could possibly have in order to help your loved ones. And so the sacrament, this sacrament brings unity to families, brings unity to friends, brings unity to the body of Christ. It's about unity. It's about community. This is what we read in Ephesians chapter four, verse four. St. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling of which you have been called with all humanity, humility and gentleness, with patience, Bearing with one another in love. Making every effort to maintain the unity 
of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. So we are all united. That's the whole point of the Mass, the Eucharist, unity. St. Paul says, though we are many, we are all one body because we all partake of the one bread. Not too long ago, I was in Poland with Gary Stevens and we were given a workshop. It was a men's retreat for the weekend. And as I was talking to the people, I really felt that there was this unity and disunity and it didn't make sense in my head. I wasn't really calling it unity and disunity. I just knew that there was something really strange going on and I don't know what it was. It was like there was a confusion as I was talking to people. I knew I was talking to people who believed in what I was saying, but it was almost like they were separated from one another. And it was only when we were doing the healing service that I realized, my gosh, everyone right now is one. One in their sufferings, one in their need for healing. And that's when I realized that's true of every talk I've given. There is unity and disunity. And when people go to confession, I can see the difference the very next day in the workshops the very next day. It, and you feel it. The atmosphere completely changes because now all of a sudden there is communion with one another. There, is no, there are no obstacles in your way to that friendship, that fellowship. And more than ever, we need that, don't we? We need that in our families because Satan is attacking the families. That's what St. Lucia told a priest in a letter. The last battle of Satan will be against marriage and the family. So we absolutely need this sacrament and we need to, t to take it seriously. So we read that God the Father has reconciled the world to himself through the death and resurrection of his son. How? Because Jesus united us to himself in the womb of Mary. And so when Jesus went through that death and resurrection, we went through it with him, especially in our baptism, where we die with Christ, we raise with Christ, so that we can be united to the triune God, unity. And then we read that God sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Now, do I really believe that? Do I really believe that I can be forgiven from my sins in confession through this sinner, through this priest? Do, I re do you really believe it? Really? Truly? Here? Not just here. Really? Are you convicted by it? I absolutely am. There are many different reasons why. One reason is because when you hear about stories about exorcisms, one of the things that happens is you have to go to confession before an exorcism takes place. And the reason why is because the devil knows your sins and will use them against you. I heard this story in South America of an exorcism taking place and the Lord Mayor was, was present and through the person being exercised, the devil shouted out, I know your sins. You slept with this woman last Wednesday. You had an affair. Of course, he turned around and ran. He was red-faced, ashamed. And then the priest turned to him and said, I suppose you're going to tell everybody my sins now, aren't you? And the devil said, I can't. You have none because you went to confession. The devil sometimes has a little bit more faith than we do. Doesn't he? If you want to convince people about the power of Mary, again, the devil trembles when Mary's invoked. That's the power of Mary and the saints. The power of sacramentals are used. We see them in deliverance ministry. We see them in exorcisms. Another reason why I truly believe that my sins are forgiven after their confession is because I am lifted. It's almost like this explosion of grace comes in and I can do far more. And all of a sudden, the decisions that I couldn't make beforehand, I can make now, clearly, easily. And all of a sudden, solutions come to me. And what family doesn't want that? What family doesn't want to be able to make solutions quickly when there's a crisis? 
Go to confession, remove the blocks, get rid of that darkened intellect which sin has caused. Let the light of Christ shine in you and you'll be able to make all the right decisions because when God reconciles us, you personally, to himself, that means you are of one will with him and he is making those decisions in you. You are at the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Amen? Need a drink. It's also scriptural, the fact that priests are able to absolve us from our sins because we read, peace be with you. This is Jesus, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, he's talking to the apostles, the priests. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You know when Jesus said that? It was after the resurrection. I think he's trying to tell us something. After we go to confession, there is a resurrection, especially if we are in state of mortal sin. After we go to confession, our soul is resurrected to new life, a new level, a new depth. We need to move closer to God so that he can give us more of himself, more gifts, more graces. We have to constantly desire more and more and more and never be comfortable with where we are at. I always wondered, why is it that Miles, I, God was so alive in Miles. Why? Why did he speak with such depth? When he spoke, it came from a deep well within him. How did that happen? It wasn't just years of experience. What is the difference between him and many people who are Catholic? You know, in the last 20 years, I've known some amazing priests on fire for God, deep. And I've also known many who are very comfortable. And I wouldn't say that they were on fire for God. I never experienced God alive in them like I did in Miles. And I question that, why? Because they celebrate mass sometimes three times a day. So they, they're getting Christ three times a day and they're in the person of Christ miles once a day and he's not in the person of Christ. How is it I experience God alive in him but not in many of these other priests? And there's only one explanation I can find and that is desire. Miles desired more and more and more of God and he never stopped desiring no matter how much pain he was in, no matter how much he was suffering, even on his dying day, the last breath, He just wanted more of God. He never had enough. He never got comfortable. He would always say this prayer, Lord, expand within me a greater capacity to receive more of you. And I would see him saying that prayer as he pushed himself in agony off his wheelchair. He would say that prayer and I would think, how? We have to ask God for the grace to desire If you've become comfortable, if you know someone in your family who's just going through the motions, just ticking the boxes, lukewarm, pray that they get the desire for more of God. Pray that God increases within you a greater desire. That's what it means to be charismatic. To have desire, a deeper desire, to be on fire, to change the world, to save souls. That's what this is all about, the salvation of souls. And we'll regret it when we get to the next life. We'll wish we had more of a desire in this life to do more for God. So we need a greater desire. And then we read in the prayer of absolution, through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace. How do we experience this peace? This peace that we long for When we sin, what is it actually attacking within us? What is so wrong with sin? All of a sudden now, anything goes. To sin is freedom. I can do whatever I want, with whoever I want, whenever I want. The church has got all these rules and rituals and regulations and boundaries. Don't need that anymore. I want to be free. And yet the church is telling us that sin actually hurts us. Well, what is it then? It's hurting If it hurts you, 
Even these venial sins, these little sins, that you think, well, I don't need to care about them. I'm not really hurting anybody. God will forgive me, and he will. But they are still causing wounds. What is it within us that they are wounding? I would say this. What they are wounding at the very deepest level of who we are as human beings, what it is wounding is our dignity. Dignity. The word dignity in Latin, dignus, it means worth. It's ruining our worth. God knows our worth. He knows what you are worth. He died for you. He suffered for you because that's what you are worth to him. He, you, you know how much God loves you because of the film, The Passion of the Christ. And when you see the suffering there, he didn't just do that for us. He did that for me. He did it for me, knowing that I would be created 2,000 years later. He did it for me, knowing that I would be the cause of this and continue to sin. And he still did it for me because he sees in me that I am worth it. Sin attacks our worth. It attacks our self-worth. And by our self-worth, what I mean is all of a sudden we don't see ourselves anymore as created in the image and likeness of God. All of a sudden we don't see ourselves as a child of God. We don't want to think about it because our conscience is now dulled, numbed. In order to continue to sin, you have to shut that voice up inside your head. And our conscience is how God speaks to us. So when we go to sin, there's something in there saying, don't do it. You know, you're not supposed to. You still have time. Pull back. This is not good for you. You're going to get in trouble. And you think, oh, that Catholic guilt. I've got to get rid of that. So you ignore it. And it gets harder and harder until eventually it goes away. And then you forget. Or you don't even want to face the fact that God is watching you, listening to you, involved in your life. He wants to be fully involved. And so it attacks your self-worth to the point where you don't even think you're a child of God. You don't want to think about it. But it doesn't change how God sees you. It doesn't change your worth. Because the greatest sinner in the world, God still sees as his son or daughter, child. In that person, in God's eyes, that person still has dignity. But in that person, that dignity is gone. That self-worth has gone. And we see that in Adam and Eve, don't we? Our first parents, after they sinned, what did they do? They ran away from God. They wanted to hide because they felt naked and ashamed. And that's what, how we feel. We feel naked, we feel ashamed. We want to hide from God. We want to ignore this voice. But when we go to confession, all of a sudden, we experience an incredible peace. And then we begin to hear God speaking to us again through our conscience. And so sin not only divides us from each other, not only divides us from God, it divides us from ourselves, within ourselves, because our conscience is attacking us and we're fighting against it. That's division. Sin got in there. Now we're at war. We're at war. We're trying to battle. We don't want to ignore it, but we have no choice if we want to keep on sinning. And the only answer is to shut this thing up is either continue to sin so severely that that's it, it's gone. And you're so dark within yourself and heavy. And you can see when you meet people who are like this, as opposed to people who are free and happy and filled with joy and listening to their conscience. The only answer really to get that peace of mind. What is peace of mind? Peace of mind is where your conscience is not attacking you. Peace of mind is where you're hearing God's voice in your conscience You've learned to listen to how God speaks to you in the silence, the depths of your heart. And you get that when you go to confession, when you get that sacrament. You come away and you are convinced, convinced that God has forgiven you and healed you. And that's why it's so important to do an examination of conscience beforehand. Really examine what it is you need to confess and how deep you need to go. There's no such thing as too deep. If you think you need, you've gone deep enough, get the pen and pad out and start going a little bit deeper and deeper. Try and get to the root, especially of the habitual sins, those sins that just keep sending you back to confession over and over again. 
Go to the root. Maybe your problem is that you think everybody else needs to change except for you. That's a problem, that's pride. If you don't think you need to go to confession, go to confession and confess pride because it's pride that's telling you you don't need to go. So if you think everybody else needs to change but you, then there might be a problem with control. Ask yourself, who is more controlling, my mother or my father? Chances are you've got it from one of them. And that's what you need to confess because what I realized in my own family is I thought, because I was Catholic, my dad wasn't what it isn't, and my brother suffers with mental illness and he annoys me like you wouldn't believe, and he has his addictions, you know, gambling and shopping addiction and the fights are unbelievable. I thought they were the one who needed to change. I thought I was doing everything right. I go to mass, I read the Bible, I give talks, I'm a speaker, I'm Catholic, I know my faith, you need to change. But they didn't. For years and years and years, they didn't change. And I questioned God, why? And you know what he said? Because you need to change. That's why. I thought they needed to change. God said, no, you're the one who needs to change. That's why they're in your life. You're not in their life to change them. They're in your life to change you. So what did I do? I listened. Oh, did I struggle. I accepted. And I tried to change. I became more accepting. Whenever they needed something, instead of fighting it. You know, I'm a teacher by nature. So when somebody asks me for something, I'd rather help them do it themselves because that's in my nature. It's, it's a way of teaching. I want you to learn yourself as much as possible. But what I learned the hard way is my dad and brother, you can't teach them anything. They can't learn. It's not their fault. There's stuff going on within them. And so whenever they asked me to, to do something, I would hesitate, I would try and get them to do it. And the arguments and the frustrations and the impatience within me would all, would all come. But God is showing me that that is with, all within me. That's my problem and I was putting it onto them. And so I began to change. Okay, whenever they asked me to do anything, I'm just gonna do it. I'm not gonna argue, I'm just gonna do it. And wow, what a difference that made. Massive difference. And I seen healing in them, big healing within them and it's continued and if you don't know what it is within you that needs to change if you don't know what it is within you that you need to confess while you're doing this examination of conscience ask God to give you an illumination of conscience and I guarantee he will he's never let me down yet when he gives me an illumination of conscience he shows me what it is within me that I need healing from. See, this is the thing. Sins tend to come from a place of hurt. And so we repeat the same sins because the hurt hasn't been healed or dealt with. And getting to the very root of those sins, you're gonna arrive at a wound, something, an insecurity, something that needs to be healed. And so what an illumination of conscience is, is where God shows you what it is, that wound, that root, that needs to be healed. And he reveals you to yourself and we might as well ask for it now because we're getting it in the next life. At least in this life, we can, get out, we can have it a little bit at a time. In the next life, I think it's gonna be very painful all at once. And when he shows this something to me, it usually takes me a week to get over it because that's the pain it causes me. St. Faustina, in her Divine Mercy diary, explained the illumination of conscience that she had. This is what she said. Suddenly, I saw the complete condition of my soul as God sees it. I could clearly see all that is displeasing to God. Right, I'm expecting you all to ask this today and hopefully by tonight you will know what to confess, but how painful would that be to see your soul the way God sees it and everything that is displeasing? He sa she says, I did not know that even the smallest transgressions will have to be accounted for. What a moment. Who can describe it? To stand before the thrice holy God. And then come these most powerful words in the prayer of absolution. I absolve you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Every sin committed forms a relationship. There's a relationship with that sin. There's a fallen angel behind that sin. So you could be forming relationships with those fallen angels. That's the whole point of deliverance ministry. Exorcism happens in confessions. Deliverance happens in confessions. You were baptized. That was an exorcism that happened. When you make the sign of the cross, that's also considered an exorcism. The most powerful deliverance that we can have, of course, is the mass. Why? Because we are forming relationships with sins all the time. So we need deliverance all the time. Those relationships need severing. We are binding ourselves to our sins when we make them. Do you know what the word absolve means? To unbind. That's what's happening when the priest says, I absolve you. You are being unbound to your sins. Those sins within you are being severed. There's another word actually to describe the relationship that we have with some of these sins. And that word, you might have heard it, is called soul tie. Soul ties. We experience soul ties when we have relationships. And some of them are not good relationships. You want to have soul ties, don't you, in a good way with your wife, husband, with your children. But what about bad soul ties? What if you have a soul tie with a partner and at first, you know, everything's going well, but then all of a sudden it gets really bad. There is abuse. You separate. For a long time you're wounded, you need healing. That soul tie can still be there. Or if people are in relationships of sin, they're forming soul ties and it's not good. Soul ties need to be severed. I looked up a little bit more about soul ties on the EWTN website and somebody asked a woman called Joannette Benkovic, you might have heard her, she does Women of Grace on EWTN, and what is it about these soul ties, are they Catholic, is it real? And so she asked the priest that they normally use, the theologian that they use, Father Edmund, and this is what he said, soul ties are explained as being formed through intense relationships or inordinate affections with spouses, close friends, sexual partners, business partners, cults, religious denominations, and lodges. Soul ties resemble a kind of spiritual umbilical cord that connects one person to another in the spiritual realm. When these relationships are ungodly, such as those forged in sexual sin, for example, adultery, premarital sex, or for the purpose of control, manipulation, or domination, in other words, controlling parents, friends, bosses, etc., they can have a toxic effect on our life in Christ. For this reason, soul ties should be properly severed in order for a person to free themselves from any spiritual bondage. He says, this priest, I have used explicit prayers for the breaking of these ties, usually in confession, and I asked the person to explicitly renounce the ties and forgive the person they were involved with, thereby setting them free. The most important thing about confession is removing the blocks of allowing God to pour his grace within us. And one of those blocks is forgiveness, unforgiveness. We have to forgive. It's in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as you forgive forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses. We have to forgive. Otherwise, there is an obstacle to healing Those who have been in deliverance ministry for a long time or the healing ministry for a long time all say the same thing about the free blocks to healing. Father Rufus Pereira was one of them. He also said that these free blocks, one of them is unforgiveness. You have to forgive. Another block is a lack of renunciation of sin. You have to seriously ask yourself, do I really want this sin to stop? 
you might have a relationship with the pleasure that it gives you. So the pleasure is the problem. That's why we do it. That's why we keep going back to it. So you have to ask God, take away the pleasure I'm getting from this and give me a disgust for it because it is sinful. As Saint David, King David said in Psalm 51, it is against you, O Lord, and you alone have I sinned. And yet sins give us pleasure. We should have no pleasure in sinning against God, should we? So we need to remove the blocks, unforgiveness, lack of renunciation. We need to renounce that sin in Jesus' name. Lack of repentance. We need to be serious. We need to change. We want to change. We need to move forward. Amen? Amen. My time is up. Thank you very much.